This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. No matter your life stage, you can plan on Farm Bureau Health Plans for great health coverage with a sensible price tag. Visit FBHP.com. I'm Mike Keith with a very special guest from WKRN News 2 for 43 years. Bob Mueller. Nice to see you, Mike. Thank you for asking me to be part of this. This is exciting. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I remember the first time I met you, January 2000. Atlanta, Uh Planet Hollywood, (laughs) the Monday before Super Bowl Thirty Four, and it's one. I have a lot of memories of that week. Ice storm, (laughs) the the ice storm, all of it. But I'll never forget. John Dwyer asked me to be on the program you guys were doing down there, and I walk outside, and there's Bob Mueller, and I'm like, "What's Bob Mueller (laughs) doing here?" And so I knew it was a big deal then. I was on the road a month that year because obviously that was, you know, the, the magical year of 1999. We did a, a special outside of Nissan's Adelphia Coliseum that turned into the Music City Miracle. We moved to uh, uh, Indianapolis, broadcasting out in the snow, and watched the Titans fans take over the stadium in Indianapolis and Peyton Manning false start. Then we flew to Jacksonville where Butch Beard and almost got in a fist fight with some, with some Jacksonville fans. We win there. We do our post game in a pouring rain on the field in, in Jacksonville with one light, me and John Dwyer. They turn the stadium lights out on us, and we're in the rain with one Klieg light on us for an hour. We finish our show soaking wet, have to run to the airport, get in a plane to fly to Atlanta, where we're there for a week. That was, pretty a, good. That was pretty, a wild 22 that was, days, that wasn't it? That was an unbelievable time. So how did they, you're on the news side, how did they get you involved in all of that? We were doing a lot of the... Who's coming to the game? Who's the sponsors that are coming to the game? Uh, where are some of the, the, uh, the charity money going to? We did a lot of stuff with kids in the, in the NFL zone. Uh, we, we, uh, we did kind of the, the, the outside of sports aspect of it, how this Super Bowl and how this team is affecting the community of Nashville during this stop, during this run. The Indianapolis thing, as we go there this week, I think is the forgotten part of the trip because – Everyone remembers the Music City Miracle Game. Everyone remembers Jacksonville. Everyone remembers the Super Bowl. But the Indianapolis thing was really a wild deal because when we arrived Saturday Fans night. Fans everywhere, everywhere. Everywhere. And, I mean, it was shocking. Yancey when, Thigpen in his white <laughs> white coat coming yeah. in. And, and the, the hotel room, we were there when the, when the team arrived absolutely packed with fans hanging from the rafters cheering these guys on to come in. And the stadium, you remember, you did the game. The stadium was filled with more Titans fans than Colts fans, and Peyton had at least three false starts. They did at their own state. They had to take a timeout to, because the crowd was too loud on offense in the first half, and it was just a, it was an incredible experience. You and I have something in common. We both moved here from Chattanooga. Yes, and I remember when we moved here, I knew Nashville was the state capital, and I knew Nashville was bigger than Chattanooga, but I don't remember thinking Nashville was that much bigger or that much. Did, did you have the same impression when you moved exact here? Exact same impression. The, the reason I wanted to come here, I was really into politics, and obviously being the state capital, it would be more in tune with what I was pursuing in my broadcast career. So I wanted to come cover the state capitol. But yeah, it was a little bit bigger, but really not much different than Chattanooga. It was kind of a, a quiet town with, you know, some some power folks over here and nobody went downtown. <laughs> and that was it. Three restaurants, maybe. It was, you know, it was the, the reason I came here was for, for work because I wanted to cover state politics. And, you know, the first thing I covered was Lamar Alexander's gubernatorial run and Got to meet Howard Baker and got to meet folks from when I was in college covering Watergate hearings, uh, hearing them on the radio, then got to inter- in meet these folks and eventually, you know, Al Gore, two presidential runs. So that was why I came here and it paid off for me. But you could certainly understand that 22-day period in January 2000 and what it meant to people based on what it had been like when you came here 20 years ago. It was quite a moment. Well, and, and Mike, you know this too. There's Nashville before pro sports and after pro sports, and there's it's night and day. You know, once the arena came, we didn't have a team, but then we got the team, and then, you know, the miracle happens that the, 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 the Oilers want to come to Nashville, and that actually happens. There's no comparison between 
when that happened and what was before that. Before that is not even close to what we're seeing now. All right, so I want to mention Duncan here real quick because we're doing the OTP, and it's always game on with Duncan, so grab a coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before watching the game at home. Duncan is always there to help you get your game on, just like the pros, like Bob Mueller. Mm -hmm. We need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual, because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. Bob Mueller. Yes, sir. Where were you when the Music City Miracle happened? Well, like the old 300,000 people that were in that building. (laughs) I I actually was in the building. I was in our suite. We had done a pregame show, and... My general manager was kind enough to let us come watch the game in the suite. And our suite was next to a big double suite. That big double suite belonged to Bud Adams, the owner of the Tennessee Titans. And so the game progresses, and with 16 seconds left, Buffalo kicks the field goal, and the stadium is sucked dry of air. Everybody in our suite, everybody in the other suite are you know, putting stuff down and getting ready, and they're heading to the doors, and people are leaving. And I am the only one. I'm sitting on a glass window with a window slide open, kind of leaning halfway out of the out of the suite into the stadium. I'm going, you know, we got Al Del Greco. If, if we can make a, we we're not out of this yet. And then they make the kick, and it's a short kick, and a, a, a Lorenzo Neal gets it. We see him toss back to Wycheck. What's this? And there's. <laughs> Here he goes down, down. Kevin Dyson wide open catches it for seventy-five yards, and the place explodes. And everybody comes running back into the suites. The last person in is Mr. Bud Adams. <laughs> so, so he was not he, in there. He was not in there when it happened. He wait, was a minute, the, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Bud Adams was. You saw him. I was there. He was not in the suite. They had left, and they left. He was be- headed out. They were heading out of the suite before the kickoff that turned into the Music City Miracle. They re- got back into the suite after the celebration was going on in the end zone. You have given the OT people <laughs> something they didn't know. That's crazy. Yeah, well, that's I, I love telling that story. Okay, so <laughs> as, as somebody who spent his life in journalism, and you were deep into it even at that point, did you realize at that moment the significance of what had just happened? No, no. Uh, you know, I didn't know anything about sports what's it like to go to a Super Bowl or what this, this win means? Just, it just means, okay, you're going to go play another football game. Uh, or, or what does it mean for the city of Nashville? No, I don't think anybody understood how that game, how that the Music City Miracle changed Nashville. For one thing, it's always going to be remembered for it. It's been replayed a thousand times, and your call is fantastic. Oh, thank you. You and Pat Bryan were just fantastic. Uh, and so, no, I don't think anybody, I think as the years have progressed, we've realized what that what that one play meant to this city wow um when did you know you were going to indianapolis well we knew we had planned uh before the playoff before the wild card game that you know this is what we're going to do if this all have this wins we're going to go and so we were packed and ready to go we did our show me and john dwyer it, you know the, the the sunday was a sunday or saturday game i can't remember anymore the, uh, <coughs> the buffalo game was saturday that's what i thought it was saturday game and then we did that game we win we do our post show and we're off to indianapolis and spending a week up there it snowed on us we're broadcasting <laughs> in the snow outside you know it was so exciting it was so much fun the most fun i've ever had in my career I, I absolutely the most fun all these fans are so excited and the indianapolis is the bars and the restaurants are packed with Titans fans. Game day approaches, and it's cold outside, and we get inside, and the place is just rocking with fans. It, the hardest thing about my job at that point was trying to be uh, poised and, and not cheer the team on in the broadcast booth because, you know, I'm, I'm a news guy, and, and I'm not covering the game. I'm covering other aspects of it, but I can't cheer in there for them. So we win in Indianapolis. We, we do our post game. Me and Dwyer are just looking at each other like, this is unbelievable. We didn't think we were going to leave Indianapolis with a win and head into Jacksonville. And you can't beat Jacksonville three times in a row. You can't have, it just can't happen. And they were so cocky. Their fans were so, they knew they were going to win. And anybody who looked affiliated with the Titans was just given grief by everybody. They were pushing and shoves at Saturday nights before game parties with people. Like I said, Bush Pearson and somebody else almost got into a fist fight. And I will never forget the whoop and the Titans put on Jacksonville and seeing Matthews lift that trophy and seeing that the team on the field with that trophy afterwards just going, 
we're going to the Super Bowl, the first Super Bowl for this franchise, and what it meant to these players and the owners and the coaches and Jeff Fisher and everybody. People are in tears, and it was just a feeling of like, these guys have really accomplished something. It doesn't really matter what goes on from here, but this is, this is something that they have wanted forever, and they finally got it. It made me so happy because I'll never forget all the people who had worked for the mm-hmm. Oilers mm-hmm. who had been close. In the late 70s and early 80s, the Steelers kept them out of two Super Bowls, and then they had the seven straight winning seasons with Warren Moon, and they went through the move, and and every, and, and they didn't want to move. Right. You know, that yep. wasn't their idea. Right. But once they got here, they realized it was a special place. They came to embrace it. They said, man, this is – this is something else. You and think the ownership and the Titans players and teams at that time when they came here were surprised by how they were greeted, by oh, how no they doubt. were accepted? There's no question. I, I mean, I, it was a little rough going in because the stadium wasn't built yet, and you were playing in Memphis and, and in Vanderbilt for a couple of years. And But once you got to the stadium, it just seemed like the, to the team enveloped or the city enveloped the team. Well, and it was such a wave, too, because we played the first game at the stadium. It's Friday night against the Falcons in the preseason. We throw deep on the first play of the game, and everybody's like, hey, this is our place. And, you know, people thought Nissan Stadium was so special because it had chair back seats. <laughs> you know, that was that was the amenity. It wasn't Wi-Fi and big screen and LED. And it, at that time, it was like, we don't have to sit on a bench. This is fantastic. We might as well be on the Starship Enterprise. And then we start 3-0, and lose a game, get to 6-1, and lose a game, get to 9-2, and lose a game, and then win our last four. And we go 13-3 and and – It's been this fun year. We get to host a playoff game. Well, we're going to lose. It's okay. Buffalo's been really good. And then all this stuff happens. And the significance of the miracle play, I contend that it's the most significant play in NFL history. And and here's why. Because we advanced from there to the Super Bowl. The, The immaculate reception, the Steelers lost the next week. Now, it may have been a more spectacular play, maybe. I don't know. But the other part of it that I don't think is taken into account is what is discussed by you, and that is not just the football significance, but what the next 22 days meant to the franchise, to the region, to a generation of, of people my kid's age, your kid's age, yep. who, who became NFL fans in that moment. It established football in a region of the country and solidified the move. And we were doing, once we got to Atlanta and the Super Bowl week, and we were doing an extra, we were doing all our newscasting, we were doing an extra half an hour, extra hour after the newscast from uh, the, uh, what were we, the ESPN zone, that's where we were. And our ratings, we had the game, we were fortunate enough, ABC had the game that year, we were, our ratings were through the roof. Everybody in Nashville was watching you guys, watching us tell the story of what was going on in Atlanta, through the ice storm, through everything that was going on. And, and I'd like to know, you know, what was it like for you guys? Because I know what it was like for us. It was strange because as the game is ending and it looks like it's tied, they move the media. We're going to the locker room. So we miss Titans get going down. Right. We, we're in, in the foyer somewhere heading down to the locker room and hear the yell, and we don't know what it is, and then we find out what it is. It's the deep pass it's, to Bruce. It's, it's yeah. the it's, – it's the, the, the one poor <laughs> defensive play we made the yeah. whole game. But then we're kind of peering out, and we see McNair making his run, and it, there's no question this is going to happen. And then, you know, Kevin Dyson on the end of that whole year from the Music City Miracle to one yard short, and you can't believe it's over with. And it just it's just like it's over. It, it's, it's over. And then we, you know, for security reasons, people were – maybe taking their job a little too seriously. We're trying to get out to cover <laughs> to cover the they won't let us out on the field and we're we got where we going live. We gotta get out there. We gotta go. We gotta go. Finally get out there and, and Al Del Greco's in tears. He's the first person we talk to. And we're you know, we're we're so proud of these guys and we know also how much it, it just hurts that they were this close to, to you know, who knows if we'd have won, but this close to keeping the game going to give it another shot. And I remember interviewing Jeff Fisher, and, and I've never seen him at a loss for words. And he was at a loss for words with me and John were talking to him. And, and he, he just was so proud of the team and just so disappointed at the same time. It's the most empty I've ever felt it, after anything. I mean, to lose a Super Bowl that way, 
after that 22 days. And we got back to the hotel, and they have a post-Super Bowl party. Travis Tritt is performing at our, <laughs> at our post-Super Bowl party, and I will always be a Travis Tritt fan because he. I felt like I needed to go down and go to the party. My wife didn't want to go down. She was worn out. She says, how can you do this? I said, well, they've done this nice thing yep. for us. I should go down. And he stopped his set, and he goes, listen, he goes, I just want you to all know how proud we are of you, and you played a great game. And, of course, you know, the president – called yep. us after the game. Yes, yes. I've never heard of the president well, calling the losing team. Well, we did a parade for the losing team never in heard Nashville. Of it. Never heard of it. And I've always wondered if they if 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 it was the wrong thing to do. I don't think it was. I think the city was so in love with this team, it was showing appreciation even though they didn't win it that they wanted to pre- show the appreciation for these guys for what they did. And I think the players appreciated that even even though they didn't have a Lombardi trophy with right. them. And the downtown was insane. Well, they say and I, and I don't know that anyone counted, but it has been said that there were more people at the runner-up Super Bowl <laughs> parade in Nashville than there were in St. Louis at their Super Bowl championship it's, parade. It was crazy. People took their kids I'm out of school. I'm from St. Louis. They're not okay. great big football fans. They're better yeah. baseball fans. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, I, it, it was packed downtown. Well, I mean, we were broadcasting live, obviously, and I'm, it's the, the players are on the backs of convertibles coming through, and people are throwing confetti, and there's Titans flags everywhere, and there's kids everywhere, and they're signing autographs as they go by. Uh, you know, the mayor's down there. It, it was a just it was a big thank you is what it was. Yeah, it was um, to go from, you know, we have the parade right there the first part of February. And if you had gone back six months, we didn't know if we were going to sell out all the games. <laughs> you know, we had to work hard to sell out the first preseason mm-hmm. game and then the second preseason game and then the regular season opener against Cincinnati. That, to me, that set the whole stage. For that. They, they were going to lose that game, and they pulled yeah, it out. Pulled it out. And then the Cleveland game that followed. And so then we, you know, when we started 3-0, and then we sold out a couple more games. And when the record got better, we, we sold out the season. And, you know, that was the goal. But that was no sure thing. No. And you look back on it now, that, how that changed that whole period of time. And like this weekend, Titans fans are going to go to Indianapolis. Yes, they are. Next weekend – Thousands of Titans fans are going to London. And what we're talking about almost 25 years ago set the stage yes, for this, did. which yeah, is I've really crazy. I've never seen anything like it. I don't, I'd have to talk to other people in the, that broadcast in other cities, but I've never seen – it was like a college atmosphere. Mm-hmm. It was like tailgating from going to college games. The, the, everybody who was a Titans fan, they got in their buses, they got in their cars, they got in the planes and followed the team. And that just doesn't happen a whole lot in the NFL on a, on a regular basis. And you think about Kevin Dyson. <laughs> what a great guy. We, I'm actually friends with Kevin, and I talk to him about this all the time and give him grief. Hey, one yard short. <laughs> and he, lo- he takes it in, but he's, on, he's the bookend for the, whole, for the whole year. He's the bookend for the mm-hmm. whole year, and, and he's an interesting story because he's the miracle guy. He, well, he's the guy who got picked before Randy Moss. He's, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's the miracle guy. He's the one-yard short guy. He's the guy who has what was on its way to being a great career, sort of short-circuited yep. because of a very strange injury that happened in practice. And now he's principal. At, he's Dr. Kevin yes, Dyson. Yes, he's Dr. Kevin Dyson. And you, you think about the impact of all of that in a 25-year period in who this person is as part of this community in all these ways. And he chose to stay here and be part of this community, which so many former Titans have. There are so many former Titans, you know this, who, who live here and call this place home because they feel so welcomed when during their playing days and, and even afterwards. And, you know, people still go up and see these Keith Bullock and, you know, you name it, that live here or visit here and are still part of this community. I don't know if you saw the reaction to Keith Bullock on Sunday. I did. It was crazy. <laughs> I did. It was rock star crazy. Well, and then he stayed out firing. Mr. Up. Monday night. He's Mr. <laughs> he is Mr. Monday night. But what he means to people, what Eddie George means to people in so many different TSU ways. TSU head football coach. How, how great is that? I mean, can you imagine being one of those players playing for Eddie George? Well, his son played at Vanderbilt and he chose to come back here and – you know, he, he becomes an actor, and he does all the things. He, I mean, he's Eddie George. Yeah. He's the beast. <laughs> he is. And then Steve McNair. Yeah. Um, the, the tragedy the, of the yeah. Titans. Yeah. And, you know, I was on a golf course with Neil Orr, my morning anchor, when I got the call. And, we, you know, just, you've got to be kidding me. And, well, I didn't believe it was true. You know, what? 
and then, then we're on the air, and then it's just it just got awful. It was just a terrible, terrible day. And I lost my father that same week. Oh, uh, 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 just a few days later. It was a, it was a terrible week for me. You know, yeah, I, I I didn't know Steve very well. I'd met him a couple of times, but the man that he was. Uh, and the way that he died, and it was just awful. It was just awful. And I know it was, but must have been just uh, crushing for the franchise. Well, you're in the Bed MGM studio. We're glad you're here, Bob Mueller. Uh, but we've got a picture of Steve McNair in the corner, and everyone who comes in has to go see that picture yeah. because he is he's the heart and soul, and losing him was crushing. And then how Eddie... Mm -hmm. Eddie George decided to take the mantle of being the lead Titan. He's the chairman of the board. He's the, he's the guy that steps forward when you have to have it uh, of, of that part of the family. It's been, it, it's been heartbreaking and at the same time gratifying to watch what has come through that because I don't think Eddie really wanted that. Yeah, I agree with you. I think he, Eddie was a great player and a, and a great representative for the Titans in the city, but, you know, I think he was a more quiet guy mm -hmm. than Steve was. Uh, Steve would never backed away from a question, would tell you exactly what he thought, uh, but, yeah, and, and liked being the, the leader of the team. All right, I got to read this for our friends at SeatGeek, the, now, the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. The deal is finalized, and SeatGeek is the newest member of the Titans family. If you haven't heard the name yet, get used to it because you'll be hearing it a lot more through the 2023 season. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. You're you probably go back to your to your start seeing a guy do live reads, right? <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. All right, so I want to ask you, this week with Bob Mueller. Yeah, thanks. On Sundays. How long has that been on? I started that show in 2006. Okay. So there was a, there was a big Senate race, Bob Corker and uh, Harold Ford Jr., and uh, that was the start of the show. I had done one in the 80s and 90s for a while, but that one's been going on since 2006. Very good show. Thank you. Yeah, especially that. if you're a political science yeah. graduate like I am. <laughs> Thank you. So well done. I uh, think it's important not just that it's my show. I think, it's, I think if people of a community want to hear from their elected officials, and there are not enough venues, and that's why I do it. I think it's important for people to hear to folks who they vote for who they vote against that their opinions what they're doing for their for their constituents what they're doing for the community what they're not doing for the community and that that's really why i do it and it's often forgotten too that uh, there is a public service mm -hmm. aspect and responsibility Absolutely. with a radio station or a television station and uh, a lot of our great titans radio stations have those sorts of programs and i hope it'll always continue well i appreciate that I, it's kind of my baby I, I write it produce it book the guests to do it all it's so. really good it, <laughs> it is really really well done um as that guy, what was a bigger accomplishment for the organization? Getting the first stadium deal done or getting the second stadium deal done? Oh, I think the second stadium deal. Really? I do. I, you know, I know. I was here during, you know, the, the, the vote that was going to happen. It was never not going to pass. It was, that was not going to happen. They were, they were not going to deny an NFL franchise to come to Nashville. I was never afraid of that. I know that there was a lot of folks that spent a lot of time campaigning. And if you look at the result, I mean, it blew it out. It was, it was a big win. I think this is difficult, was more difficult, because the political aspect of the country has changed since 1998. Uh, so I think that's why it was more difficult. That and two hundred eighty-five million, as opposed to two point one billion, right. is a big difference. Uh, but I think the positive that that didn't happen for whatever reason with the Titan Stadium that's there currently is that this is not just the stadium. This is River North, Oracle, what the city's going to, this is, East Bank will be unrecognizable in five years. There's going to be a whole new community, walking bridges, maybe a marina, parks. This isn't just about the Titan Stadium this time. This is about a whole development of public, public private uh, monies that are coming in there that's going to transform the city. That's why I think it's more important and, and was harder than the first one. Well, the other aspect of it, too, is in the first one, Nashville had no leverage. No. <laughs> they, 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 they either had to do it or they didn't. And this time around, it was said, let's change how Metro's portion of this is going to be paid for. And with I think the, that was fair. Yeah, with the hotel motel and with, you know, the sales tax issues around there. And to see, you know, what this place is going to be, 
is exciting. I'm thrilled it's staying in the same I'm too. footprint, too, because I love that we have the stadium where we do. Yeah, I, I know you can't, but I, I think where the stadium is now is actually a better site than where the new one's going to be. I think love looking over the river. I know, but I know you can't. Just tear it down and build because you got to play somewhere. But it's going to be gorgeous. It's going to. I think that if it comes out like the the renditions are, people are going to love this thing. And and I was rooting for a retractable roof because I think, I think the 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 uh, temperatures and the and the climate here are perfect for it. But we've got translucent and there's going to be open on the sides right. of it. So I think we're we're close to being able. It's going to feel outdoors. I think we were all for retractable, but when they did the research, seeing how rarely you yeah. use it i mean just for the cost it's like a half a billion dollars oh it's crazy yeah it's crazy do you know that they could have done a retractable roof on arrowhead in 1971 no <laughs> for 25 million dollars <laughs> that it was crazy at the time there was a roof they could have slid back and forth between the baseball stadium and the football wow. stadium and so there you know there have actually been designs in this way and we're going to go to indianapolis this weekend who knows whether they'll have the roof open or not? And it's a process. If they got to kind of decide to do it, and it takes a while to get it open. So, I, I th- the the thing that I'm I'm excited about a lot of things about the new stadium, but the terraces too. Uh, that's going to give Bob Mueller the chance to look over downtown <laughs> yeah. and look over the river. Are you so, are you surprised? And I know it's because partially because of the footprint that it's actually going to be a little smaller than Nissan Stadium. No, no, no not at all. The design. I mean, I I think the the leagues. I don't mantra is not right, but sort it's of not a lot smaller, but a little bit. Well, they wanted to go fifty-five, mm. and the the Titans knew we couldn't go to fifty-five. We we had to stay in the sixties. But I, what's happened, Bob, is the change in the public's feeling about like the upper deck. Yep, and that's why you're going to see the the upper deck be at least in part sort of the party deck mm-hmm. where people can hang out. People have changed how they use tickets how they use the stadium and I think that's going to be fun because my kids would certainly buy a ticket on the party deck and yes. stand there with their friends and eat the food and drink the drink and and go out on the terrace. It attracts a different audience. It attracts yes. a different audience yep. and you know Burke Nihill has said it consistently and that is we have to give 15, 16, 17 different experiences where now at Nissan Stadium you get about four. And that's that's life. Yeah, it is. Well, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a, it'll be like, it's going to be an experience when that stadium is up and running. This has been an experience to have you here. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. And I was thinking about anybody who follows you on any of your socials, or oh, me on uh, my my boat and my skiing. Well, we know you. I mean, you were an active guy. You were an athlete growing I, up, and so getting a chance to talk sports for the news guys kind of. I, a lot of- I, you know, when I was in college, I, I, like I said, I tried to play some baseball, wasn't quite good enough, but I did get to do play-by-play for baseball, for football, and kind of soccer and basketball. And I absolutely am envious of you. I think it's why the did you mo- give it up? I think it's the most fun because in the '70s, when I was graduating, and getting in, it was when they first started hiring people that were former athletes, and that's it was a big trend. And they weren't really that everybody was kind of going in that route. So I went to news, and I love news. I, I'm, a, I'm a big news guy, but by far of everything I've done, the years I was in college doing baseball play by play were the most fun I've ever had. I Be- love doing baseball play by play. It's pretty great. It's so much fun sitting in the stands doing play by play. Well, you go to the park. Yep. You stand around during BP, and you talk into the to the manager or whoever <laughs> you're talking to the guy. I mean, it's just uh, it is the leisurely game that uh, when it goes in the seventh or eighth yep. inning, when it really goes, it's very exciting. And baseball to me is is the hard sport. You got to be a storyteller to to, to be, to be a hard. good baseball announcer. It is there's a lot of downtime, and you don't want to you don't want to just fill it with stats. You need to fill it with personality. You need to fill it with something that's going to keep an audience. Well, and the part of it too that's very complicated in calling baseball is your. You're talking about uh, the hot dog you ate and the experience you have, and then a guy hits one in the gap, yep. and you go from slow, slow, to slow to really fast. And it's a it's hard to keep up that pace and keep up with everything. But the guys who do it well yep. are the, they're the best. 
I was a big Jack Buck fan. Oh. Jack Buck and Harry Carey in the day. Jack Buck spoke at my high school senior football graduation uh, banquet. I got a picture with him when I'm 17 years old. He was, you know, he was my hero. He was such a good announcer. Now, I know he and Harry were together, but he and Mike Shannon. Yep. Oh. Yep. Mike, you know, I remember we went to Atlanta to a game in 1992, and Buck and Shannon, you know, the, one of the big reasons I wanted to go is I wanted to see them in the booth, so I brought my binoculars. And by the second inning, it was filled with smoke, and we, <laughs> and we could see the beer cooler. I mean, they were, they were old school, man. Yes, they were. They were working on some Marlboros and some, <laughs> and some Budweiser. It was a different time. It was a different time. <laughs> Man, thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Thank you for it. joining the Snickers hot seat. <laughs> Do I get a Snickers you get for the a road? Snickers. Oh, well, yeah, I'm taking that. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Bob Mueller, News 2, 43 years. Congratulations Thanks. on a great career. I appreciate it. Come back and do this again. I'd love to. Thanks okay. for the invitation. All right. For Bob Mueller, I'm Mike Keith, thanking you for joining us for the OTP. Sign me up.